we are going to get rolling here so that we don't keep people too late. Um, if you're not familiar with our format, generally on Sunday afternoons, uh, right now, at least for this current series, we're spending um, part of our block of time in here together as a group, and then we'll split up into small groups and do some further discussion and uh, question and answer time and just kind of test comprehension of the concepts that we studied in here. So if you don't have a group to integrate into, you can just pick one and jump in. <laughs> Um, welcome to stay in here with me, um, me and Brother Josh in our group. But at any rate, um, so we're studying through spiritual gifts. And in fact, this is study number 24 in this series. We've been in this study for the, for the entire year up to this point on Sunday afternoons. And we're taking our time walking through it. We built some foundational concepts initially from the scriptures. And then we're just walking one gift at a time each Sunday um, through this study. And so I want to make sure that we do as much diligence as we can. We could obviously do more, um, but get a good comprehension to people of what each one of those gifts looks like, how it's supposed to function within a local church ministry, and how we should see it function right here. But we want to make sure that it's that it's biblically understood because there's a tremendous amount of confusion out there in this topic. <clears throat> that confusion has led some to take some, some really outlandish type of stands or practices. On the other hand, it's caused some other people to shrink back so far from doing anything that, that they don't even want to touch spiritual gifts in the scriptures. We don't want to go to either one of those unbiblical extremes. We just want to see what the scripture teaches and then apply it appropriately. So today our study is on the gift of teaching, and we're just coming right up to the end of this series. We're going through the gifts alphabetically, so we're, we're at T if you can count, or if you can, I guess it's not really counting, but if you can go through the alphabet, we're at T, and there's only so many uh, gifts left. So, so stay with us, and we'll, um, we'll finish this shortly. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to begin today. We want to see a couple of the scriptures where it's particularly spoken of at, uh, in the lists of spiritual gifts, and in fact, this particular gift we're going to see <laughs> spoken of in every one of the lists of spiritual gifts because it's so crucial. Romans chapter 12 and verse 4, you should be very familiar with this scripture by now. We've read it a number of different times. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Of course, if you understand what the scriptures are teaching in Romans 12, <clears throat> also in 1 Corinthians 12, where we'll look here shortly, it's not talking about some kind of uh, indiscernible, uh, ethereal, spiritual body comprised of all people in all places. That's not a body, right? A body is a local entity, and it's talking about a local church, and it's talking about the members of local churches and so he says, as, as many, we have many members in one body using the illustration of our own human bodies, many different body parts with different functions. They don't have the same office or the same function. So we, as a local church, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one member is one of another. So we are intricately connected with each other and dependent on one another. And then he says, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. And that's our focus today. So in other words, you got the gift of teaching? Get busy with teaching. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to take you to two more scriptures to begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all prophets? Are all, I'm sorry, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? No, it's the same train of thought as what he had said in Romans chapter 12. Many different offices or many different functions within a local church. They're all needed, um, but all are not exactly the same. And then finally, um, as we just lay out some introductory scriptures, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, one of the keystone scriptures to understand spiritual gifts, Ephesians 4 and 8, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he ascended up on high, that would be when he left this earth and ascended back into heaven, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles, this is in Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors 
and teachers, all right? So three different places there we have in the lists of spiritual, um, the list of spiritual giftings, we have teachers that are mentioned or the gift of teaching. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our understanding this afternoon, and then we'll dig into this a bit. <clears throat> Father, we humble our hearts before you, recognizing fully that um, we desperately need you to open our understanding so that we can understand the scriptures. And so uh, we know that the Holy Spirit is the one who gives illumination, and we pray that this afternoon, as we've just finished with, um, with several times of study and then a meal, uh, I pray that you keep us attentive and our hearts and especially our minds would be focused upon your word and that you would help us to grow in our comprehension of your truth through it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we typically do, our typical format is first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a... Not, I was going to say an English lesson, a, a Greek lesson, I guess, slash etymology, as far as the meaning of the words themselves in Scripture. So we'll, we really want to establish what is the biblical meaning of the particular gifts. <laughs> as always, we just go to the wording of the Scripture itself to provide us our definition for this gift. God picked the words that he wanted in the Bible for a reason. So the Greek noun from which we get the gift of teaching or the word teaching is didaskalia. It's found 21 times in the New Testament. And it is rendered in several ways. Primarily, it's rendered as the word doctrine. And so when you're reading through the New Testament and you see the word doctrine, this is the word. It's the same one. One time it's rendered as teaching, and that's in our text in Romans 12. And then um, learning one time. So 21 times total. There's another Greek noun for the person who has this spiritual gift, and it is didaskalos. It's found 58 times in the New Testament. As you're reading through the Gospels, you see it a lot. You see the word master, capitalized, speaking of Jesus, 40 times. When they came and they talked to Jesus and called him master, it meant teacher. They recognized that he was a teacher. We'll see some examples of that shortly. 10 times it's rendered as teacher. Seven times it's rendered as master, lowercase. So speaking of somebody else that was a teacher that wasn't deity. And then as the word doctors one time. Can anybody think of where the word doctors is used in the New Testament? Say again. Uh, doctors, yeah, but it, it talks about Jesus who had gone into the temple and he was sitting there um, asking questions of the doctors that were there. Okay, so asking and answering questions and they marveled at his wisdom. All right, then, uh, so that's 58 times in the New Testament. And then in the verb form, which illustrates the person with this gift, it's actually doing it and carrying it out. The Greek word is didasko. It means to instruct, it means to instill doctrine, it means to expound or to explain something. That's found 97 times in the New Testament, and it's rendered as the word teach 93 times and taught four times. Now, folks, this is the primary function of local churches when we come down to it. When Jesus was preparing to depart from the earth, he focused the attention of his church on a few key tasks and he gave them his heaven-sent authority to go and accomplish those tasks. We call it the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said this. All power, that's the Greek word exousia, it means authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. All right, note that word teach. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Now, in verse 19 in the Great Commission, he commanded them to go and teach all nations. That's the Greek word, uh, matatheo. I'm not, not pronouncing that quite right, because I'm trying to hurry through it. It means to make disciples when you look at the actual definition. Make disciples. People are made disciples of Jesus Christ by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and then making the definitive choice to believe and obey the word of God. Right? That's how they become disciples. The next uh, uh, authorized responsibility of churches um, is, uh, is to baptize those who are made disciples. So the first step in all of it is a person has to become a disciple of Jesus Christ through the gospel. Then they're baptized. Um, and then in verse 20, Jesus' order to his churches is to take those who have submitted to the gospel and then have submitted to baptism and to teach them all things that he has commanded. The second word teach is different than the first one. 
That's the focus of our study today. It is the word didasko, right? Now, you, you may have somewhat recognized that the Greek word didasko sounds a little bit like a word that we have in our own language. The English word didactic comes from it. Still used pretty regularly today in our vernacular. Didactic in our language refers to exactly the same thing. It is instruction that builds or matures the understanding of another until he or she reaches completion. It's used in academic settings. It's frequently referenced as the type of instruction that's delivered in college or in a professional institution. Growing a particular competency to make a person a professional or to make them complete. We've noted multiple times throughout the course of this study that the work that we are doing during our assembly times together as a church on Sundays and on, uh, in our midweek service is not primarily evangelism. There's nothing wrong with sharing the gospel, and we always seek to share the gospel in some capacity through our, through our preaching and teaching here. But the work that we are primarily focused on doing as we follow the pattern of scriptures during our assembly time of the saints together is the work of establishing the souls of God's people in spiritual maturity so that they are spiritually and they're mentally competent and capable of going out and doing the work of the ministry. Now, if this gift of teaching is functioning properly within a local church, the result is noted in Ephesians chapter 11. This is what it says, right? Uh, you, you probably should still be there if you turn there. Ephesians 4.11, it says that Christ gave, at the end of that verse, gave teachers for, the, notice the objective, for the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting is the same word that means the maturing or the completing of the saints. It's not that you're not uh, that you're somehow sinlessly perfect. That's not the suggestion. But but so that saints can be matured, they can be brought to completion for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Those are three things that are going to happen if proper teaching is being done. But, but read on, till we all come, this work happens until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a complete and mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. That's our word here. There it's used in a negative sense where uh, improper teaching or false doctrine can just blow people back and forth. Anything that they're instructed, oh, let me go after that. There's another thing, let me go after that. No, God doesn't want that. He wants stability, all right? And so that's what teachers do. They bring stability. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, make no mistake about this. Satan is crafty, and there are many people that are crafty as well, and they may not even be intentionally trying to deceive, but they believe some false doctrine, and they may be slick-tongued. And so what is it that keeps God's saints from going down those rabbit holes? What is it that keeps them from being unstable? Well, it is teachers of God's Word that are functioning within local churches that are helping to establish and ground the saints so that they're built on the proper foundation. And so he says then, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's the objective. From whom the whole body fitly joins together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Once again, longest run on sentence probably in history, but, the, but all of it's really, really important a tremendous amount of instruction that's given in that portion of Scripture. Now, in all, as we talk about teaching or the gift of teaching, the word itself in some variation is found 176 times in the New Testament. It makes it the most referenced gift in the Bible. God emphasized this gift in such a resounding way so that we wouldn't miss its dire necessity in churches. Without it, People may very well be born again and baptized, but left in a fledgling state of spiritual immaturity and, uh, and incompetency, they may be rendered stagnant and useless to the Lord. It's a sad reality, 
but it is terribly, terribly neglected. This work of discipling, this work of teaching to ground people and bring them to maturity, many churches are perpetual nurseries rather than armies of mighty warriors. Now, everybody is immature when they're born. That was just referenced this morning. I hope that you picked up on that. It is a reality. Everyone is immature and is weak at a point in time. Uh, they're simple. That was the word that we were looking at. Um, and that's a reality even as they learn and grow. But God never intends anybody to stay in that state. It's, it's a state that should be quickly moved through and advanced beyond. The systematic, faithful teaching of all the counsel of God's word supplies the necessary nutrition for people to grow into strong men and women who are stable and who will stand. Let me emphasize to you that in teaching, the content that is being delivered by the proper use of this gift is scripture alone. Scripture alone. Here's what teaching is not. When human hypothesis or theories or opinion or philosophy is delivered, no matter how sincere it is, it is devoid of the substance that will establish people's souls. When so-called teaching consists of no more than storytelling, personal experiences or anecdotes, it's like eating spiritual Rice Krispies. Makes a whole bunch of noise. It's airy. It's fluffy. But there's nothing to it once you get into it. You'll walk away empty and hungry. Have you ever had Rice Krispies? Uh, half an hour later, like, oh man, I'm so hungry again. There was nothing there. Now, of course, we understand also that teaching which delivers false doctrine that contradicts scripture, it is to the soul of people what termites are to a building. It rots the structure, it undermines and erodes the foundation, leaves it full of holes and devoid of stability, and it will come crashing down as a result. Now, the effect of any of those types of so-called teaching are going to leave a person in that state that we just read about in Ephesians chapter 4 blown about by every wind of doctrine, unstable, immature, failing to grow, failing to be fruitful, failing to be in unity together with God's people within a church. Friends, only the scriptures will bring stability. Only the scriptures will anchor a person so that they won't drift about. Only the scriptures will build uh, you individually as a member as solid lumber into the structure of the framework of a local church body. Only the scriptures will provide the sustenance so that the local church body is compacted together and working unanimously, bringing increase and bringing edification. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17 says this, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That is our word today, didasco. It is profitable for doctrine first, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. They may be complete and matured, truly furnished unto all good works. In that scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and also in the Great Commission, which we just mentioned a moment ago, it's critical to understand that Jesus um, laid out those uh, those things or this particular process of teaching as the intrinsic basis in the discipleship process itself. Growing another person from a, this, the status of a newborn babe in Christ, again, anybody that's saved is going to be there at some point, but growing a person from that status of a newborn babe in Christ onto maturity so that they can then reproduce themselves, it takes intensive time and it takes organized effort in 2 Timothy, there is a definitive practical application of the teaching in, in 2 Timothy 3.17. It enables men of God and women of God to be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All right. So uh, in other words, instruction is given to form the knowledge and to shape people to live and walk in God's righteousness. It doesn't just stop with knowledge, but it leads to practical action. In the Great Commission, Jesus commanded his disciples to teach other new disciples to observe. That means to do 
all things that he had commanded, instructing those that were being discipled in both doctrine and holy living. Uh, folks, teachers or disciplers are not to teach the commandments of men or anything that is of other men's devisings or their own devisings, but that which is ordered by Jesus Christ in his word. You teach them to do all things that I have commanded. It's notable in all of that that Jesus attached this phrase at the end, Lo, I am with you always. He attached that to the critical work of teaching that's done. Teaching, discipling, training people to maturity is not a bore. It's not a lifeless process, but it is an exciting and dynamic delivery of truth to people's souls so that they can be shaped into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no more fruitful or exciting work to be done. I can say that from personal experience. I hope that you can as well, both in the way that your soul has been shaped and grounded in truth and also uh, in the way that you have been able to do that for other people as well. In, in that, I can certainly say that there's much more involved in this process of teaching and discipling than just meeting together for an hour once a week like this. Now, we can deliver instruction in this way. But to, to really teach people all things that Christ has commanded and to lead them into faithful obedience to that, it requires a lot more than that. It requires much more practical. Now, uh, I'll talk about that more in a bit. Since it is the authoritative word of God that's being declared, it should be done boldly, shouldn't it? Motivated and energy, energized by the Holy Spirit. I'll emphasize that that does not mean that it should be done in an ungracious way. It should not be done in an unrighteous or, I mean, a self-righteous way or in an indignant manner in its presentation. I've come to understand this, that if the truth offends people, their argument is with God. But we should never be offensive in our manner of presenting truth. Uh, we should remember, hey, we're just poor beggars whom God cared enough about to give us his truth as well. And so he's brought us out of maybe out of that state of ignorance, we've got to make sure that we're gracious in our presentation of truth. So let God's truth offend people if it must be done. We don't offend with our manner, okay? But we do need to proclaim it boldly and authoritatively because it is from the Lord. There are obviously many contexts in which this gift of teaching can be used. It may be done through systematic teaching in large groups like we're doing here. It may be done through systematic teaching in small groups. It may be done in seminary classes that we may host or in individual settings. It may be done in home Bible studies, in various community settings, or in family devotions. All of it is done under the oversight of local church authority because it's God's churches which are commissioned to do this work. And we want to be properly using the gifts so that God can bless them with his presence um, and with fruitfulness. Now, here's what I'm really trying to drive at right now. The, the method of delivery, it is systematic, verbal instruction from one who is gifted by God's Spirit unto the hearers. They teach all the counsel of God, leaving nothing out. That's scriptural in and of itself. Um, Paul specifically stated that. A teacher, uh, male or female, depending on the particular venue that they're teaching in, can teach the message uh, of a book as a whole or they may break it down to individual paragraphs or verses. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which this can, um, this can uh, unravel or, or show itself. The, the new, there, there is no new material, though, that originates from the person with the gift of teaching. The teacher analyzes and explains the Word of God, expounding the context, expounding the meaning, and expounding the application to the hearer's life. There's a, a wonderful, wonderful Old Testament example of this, we, we talked about it just a bit here a few weeks ago in, uh, in our Bible survey on Sunday morning. Ezra was a man who's called a ready scribe in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6. Now, the scribes were masters. They were teachers of the law, the Old Testament law. A ready scribe was one who was skilled and prepared at all times. They were the, the Old Testament equivalent of be instant in season, out of season, right? It was just literally they were prepared. They were masters of the law. They were able to do it when called upon. Nehemiah chapter 8, 
verses 1 through 9 gives a phenomenal Old Testament case study of skillful and systematic teaching of God's word. It demonstrates both the preparation and the delivery of the teaching. It also illustrates the preparation and the, recept the reception of the hearers to that teaching as well. All right. I got to read it to you. All right. It's nine verses. You can turn there if you want. It's Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. And I want you to really, really wrap your mind around both as a teacher and also as a, as a hearer, what you're seeing in this passage of scripture. Nehemiah 8, 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. This isn't even the teacher that's being the proactive one. This is all the people. Teacher, get God's book out. We want to hear from it. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. That's a long time to be listening. I don't know exactly how many hours that was, but our services here pale in comparison to this. It's until midday, all right? So I don't know, three hours, six hours. It was a long time straight. They were all attentive to the book of the law, right? And it says this then, and Ezra the scribe stood upon a pul pulpit of wood. You can be thankful that I'm not doing that. I'm at least standing behind it. When, which they had made for the purpose and behind him or beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Urijah and Hilkiah and Maasiah on his right hand. On his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashem and Hashbanana and Ze Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra, now look at this. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. That was just out of reverence and respect. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then, I'm not going to read all these names again, but all of these, these fellows that were there teaching, their scribes along with him and the Levites, it says, caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read, notice this, they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tirshatha, the, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said, and then um, that's where we'll stop reading. Uh, there was further specific instruction. Now, if you're a teacher, there is a pattern here for your preparation and delivery right in that scripture. If you're one who sits under teaching, which should involve all of us, by the way, there's the pattern for preparing for and hearing and receiving and applying teaching. I love it. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. The reverence of the people and the preparedness of their hearts. They're seeking the understanding and they're worshiping the Lord and they're obeying it. And then you have the teachers and those three key components that it talks about. They read in the book of God distinctly. That's where the power is. And then they gave the sense. That is, they expounded the meaning of it. And they caused the people to understand the reading. That is, hey, folks, here's how this word of God applies to your life. All right. So all of those should be present in good scriptural teaching. As we come back to, um, to the, the gift itself, the spiritual gift, the format is not one of round robin discussion with everybody tossing their opinions around. And one is just as good as the next. This sober work of teaching involves those who are gifted by God's Holy Spirit, delivering the soul-forming, maturing, life-changing Word of God to systematically develop people to maturity and completion. That's what's going on. The people understand that objective as they listen to it, and they wholly give themselves to it. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is a, a verse that we love very much in our church ministry. It instructs churches to do this critical work. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to 
teach others also. All right, that is our, our focus, our word here, didasco. That's what we're looking for as we teach other people. That leads us to understand that those with the spiritual gift of teaching must love to study the word of God. They must consume the scriptures as food for their hearts and their souls and their minds with the express purpose of knowing the Lord more deeply and making him known to other people. They take great joy and satisfaction in seeing other people learn and apply the truth of God's word to their lives. John the Apostle said this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Those folks that he was referring to, they had grown up because they had received biblical teaching. They had embraced it in their minds and their spirits. They had applied it and they were living it in their lives. And now they were walking consistently and faithfully in truth. That's what the proper use of this gifting should bring people to do. All right. So um, that's my longest point, by the way. Um, I'll be pretty quick on these next couple of points. But that was that's just kind of some of the biblical framework, the definition for the gift and what it's there for. Let me share with you some New Testament examples of the gift of teaching in church ministry. Remember, this is a supernatural spiritual gift. It is. Well, we can't get around that. It's endowed by the Holy Spirit to members of church bodies. A person with the natural talent to teach can teach just about anything. But a person with the spiritual gift of teaching teaches the content of the Bible. A person without this gift can certainly understand the Bible as they hear or they read it, but they're not going to be able to explain it and expound it like the person with the gift can. Uh, this spiritual, <clears throat> spiritual gift of teaching, it's not something that can be learned or, or acquired like a, a school teacher with a college degree. A person with a PhD, but without the gift of teaching, will not be able to expound the scriptures like one without a degree, but having the gift of teaching. All right, It's given by the Holy Spirit, to a person, and, uh, and I want to illustrate that to you just a little bit. It's a little bit comical to see this very reality unfold in Jesus' life and ministry uh, to the perplexity of many of the learned teachers of Judaism. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 says that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Every time I use this word teaching or doctrine, by the way, it's, it's the word that, that we're referencing today. Now, that same phrase is repeated in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, and it's repeated in many other places throughout the Gospels. Jesus went about everywhere, teaching. It demonstrates Christ's systematic delivery of truth with an intent to bring people to spiritual maturity. He's constantly talking to people about how they can really be his disciples. Well, it started to cause a stir amongst the well-educated men of the day, really starting with what we referenced already at 12 years old as he's sitting in the temple able to do that. But as he entered into his public ministry, it really caused a stir because these well-educated men of the day were known for their teaching prowess. But they lacked any real power in their teaching. They knew it, and so did everybody else. Uh, of the revered Jewish teacher Nicodemus, it says this, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He recognized there was something superior to Jesus' ability to teach. Well, Jesus explained to him what it means to be born again and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God through the word of God. And then Jesus asked somewhat wryly, I think, art thou a master of Israel? The word master is teacher. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? These are so basic. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23, Jesus was in the temple and it says the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things? Teaching God's word. Yeah, by what authority? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I'll also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I will likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it, from heaven or of men? Now, the reason that Jesus asked that is because he was teaching exactly the same message that John the Baptist taught. He was teaching repentance and faith for salvation. And, and uh, they knew that John and his teaching were heaven sent. They had acknowledged it themselves. They had initially tried to follow John 
but he had ultimately turned them away from his uh, teaching about repentance, or they had turned away from him, rather, because of his teaching about repentance. Now, in this case, if they admitted that John and his teaching were from God, then they'd have to admit that Jesus and his message were from heaven as well. And so it says this, and they reasoned with themselves, saying, well, if we shall say from heaven, he'll say to us, well, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of men, well, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. Um, they didn't really have any kind of sincerity in their, in their spirits at all, did they? And they answered Jesus and said, oh, we cannot tell. <laughs> they knew, they just wouldn't say it. Now, that type of response became really commonplace throughout Jesus' ministry. It was, it was supremely obvious that Jesus Christ had the supernatural gift of teaching, even though he was an unlearned man, culturally speaking, and the teachers of Judaism just could not figure out how he taught with such authority, with such dynamic results. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 2, when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these sayings? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Well, again, just a continued uh, reality in his life where uh, or his ministry, rather, where he's teaching, and he's teaching authoritatively, and everybody recognized it, and yet they were scratching their heads because they were spiritually blind themselves. They're like, hey, we're master teachers, but we don't have any kind of power like he has, and yet he's unlearned, he's a carpenter, and, uh, and nothing special at all, humanly speaking, and yet he's teaching with this authority. That continued after Jesus' departure from the earth into his disciples' ministries. In Acts chapter 4, the leaders of Judaism were grieved. It says that he taught or that they taught the people. And so they arrested them and they asked in verse 7, By what power or by what name have you done this? Peter boldly answered in that case, It is through the power of the name of Jesus of Nazareth that salvation um, comes about in people's lives and preach the gospel to them. And then it says in verse 13, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And ultimately, verse 14 says, they could say nothing against it. Now, that became a typical reaction. They knew that the disciples were ignorant and unlearned men, but they taught with power because they had been with Jesus, and they were empowered by the Lord to deliver his mighty word. By the way, I am so incredibly happy that this is a gift of God and that it's not something that we conjure up on our own. He gifts people. They expound his word. And it's obvious that it's all of him and not of us. He's chosen the base things of this world, the weak things to confound the mighty. Now, if a teacher is behaving properly, as they, uh, if God has gifted a teacher and they're delivering God's word, then all the credit goes to God and all the credit goes to his word for the, any successes in that teaching. In fact, Jesus made this very plain in John 13, verses 13 and 14, when he told his disciples, ye call me master and Lord. That's our word, right? That's the gift. And he says, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. <laughs> Teachers must be humble. They must know where the power is and where the authority really is. It's nothing of them. It's all of the Lord. I've already noted that Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12 clearly indicates several gifts that are particularly designed for the growth and the maturing of members within local churches to bring them to stability, to bring them to fruitfulness, to bring them to spiritual completion. Folks, listen to me. Avail yourself to those with the gift of teaching and treasure those with the gift of teaching. Attach yourself to them. Uh, you literally control how fast you grow spiritually by your response to those with this gift. As there is a proper response, individuals grow to maturity and they become strong pillars in a local church body, which further equips that church for effective accomplishment of its mission. I will note this, that this gift is linked with the gift of shepherds or pastors. We've noted this before as well. A couple of the functions of the office of pastors or bishops um, and, and also um, 
uh, they're the functions of the office, but also the function of just those that have a pastoral gifting is that they oversee and they feed the flock of God. Now, that's not only limited to me or to anybody else in a pastoral type of role or even anybody else that's in a public teaching role. That is for all of those who are gifted to mentor and disciple others within the church body. Now, bishops are to be apt to teach. It is a qualification. It means literally they must have this gift for appointment to that office, but it's not limited to them, or it's not limited to some niche group of clergy who are somehow elevated above everybody else in the church body. If this is such a critical function in churches, we can fully expect that many throughout the body will be gifted in this way, delivering the spiritual food of the word of God so that the young sheep may grow. I'll also note that this is not a hasty work. And it's not one that's just done on any given Sunday and is completed. Check the box. Whenever this term is used in the book of Acts during Paul's missionary work, it involved lengthy, faithful commitment for some time. I hope that you can wrap your minds around this along with me because this is a reality in the development and growth process of a local church. I observed it over five years here. It involves lengthy, faithful commitment for some time. Paul learned this reality in Antioch, his sending church. Let me give that example to you before we move on. Under the mentorship of Barnabas, Paul learned to stir up this God-given gift of teaching and, used it, and use it in the proper way. Now, the church in Jerusalem had scattered due to persecution, if you know the history. Pockets of believers had relocated all over the Mediterranean world, and they began assembling together in various locations. One particular location um, that, that there was a concentration of believers from the church in Jerusalem had especially successful ministry from those who settled there. And it says in Acts 11 and verse 20, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now, if you understand the teachings of the New Testament, you should recognize that churches aren't just magically formed that way. Churches start churches. And so Barnabas was sent out as a representative of the Jerusalem church to oversee and authorize the formation of those groups of believers into new churches. Acts 11, 22 says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, there was something about the fervor and the focus of that church that drew Barnabas's heart and he wanted to stay there and be a part of it. He'd been in Jerusalem for a long time, but he wanted to be there. But he said, I got to put a pin in this for a minute because I got to go locate Saul of Tarsus. I've met him before. I got to bring him here too. He's got to have a part in this as well. And so he, he went and did that. Now, it seems like that church was just the perfect incubator for spiritual maturity. Some churches are like that because they're working the right way. And so it says then, departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled. Notice a whole year, all right? It's not just an overnight work. A whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. They engaged this spiritual gift. There was intensive, systematic teaching that was being done, which was maturing the saints in that body. It was enabling them for service to the Lord. All the saints were being developed. And other teachers were also being stirred up and developed. And so when we come to the very next verse in Acts 13, 1, it says, um, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And so it just gives us a list of these different guys. Some stayed right there, and they continued that robust ministry of teaching in that church. Others took that ministry on the road at God's direction, and they did the same systematic work in other locations. Paul and Barnabas were called to go out and to do that work elsewhere. In Corinth, Acts 18.11 says that Paul continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. In Rome, Paul spent several years teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. 
between his missionary trips, he went back to his home church every time. And it says, and he continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. The result of that systematic sound teaching is seen in the wording of scripture, which refers to the need for uncorrupt doctrine, the need for sound doctrine, the need for good doctrine, the need for doctrine that is according to godliness. Those things should be evident in the lives of God's people, both in what they believe, in what they profess, and in what they practice. God's churches are called the pillar and ground of the truth in 1 Timothy 3.15. This gift builds healthy believers. It builds healthy church bodies. Without this gift being effectively utilized, churches quickly fall into error and sin. Teachers help to make sure that that doesn't happen. They recognize it when scripture is abused and used out of context or with ill intent. They love the truth and they speak it in love. They never hide or withhold it. They don't shun to teach the whole counsel of God. They don't relegate the teaching ministry to just Sunday morning. On the contrary, they follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who taught in the synagogues and in the temple and in houses and on mountainsides and on seashores and on boats and on trails and everywhere else. He was around people who wanted to hear the scriptures. And so the effect of this ministry, I hope you're getting this, is the faithful upholding of God's word and the growth and maturity of church members to, uh, to completion or to maturity until Jesus Christ returns. Now, um, I don't know where the time is going today. I did start a few minutes late. Bear with me for just a sec here, all right? Let me talk about the application of the gift of teaching. As always, there is a universal application. This gift is supernaturally given, and it manifests itself in certain church members for sure. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't expect all of his people to be growing in their ability to effectively communicate his word. Once again, like all the other spiritual gifts, you have kind of the subject matter experts that got a point um, with that gifting, but they just help to shine the light on this particular gifting for other people in the church to grow and to learn in it as well. That's our life as believers. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Philippians 2, 15 and 16 lays the responsibility on the entire church membership at Philippi to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation holding forth the word of life. There's a stern rebuke that's given to members of local churches in Hebrews 5.12, which says this, When for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So you have these guys that, well, it seems like they grew a little bit. Then they went back to here. It's like a, uh, like a baby or a child that grew up and started eating solid food and needed to go back to milk again. It didn't make any sense. And Paul says, you, that's what you guys are. You ought to be teachers already. You're absorbing all of these resources. Don't be like that. Take in the word of God as it's given to you, and you'll be more readily equipped to teach God's word. Now, even if you aren't particularly gifted in this area, you still can and must communicate God's word in your home and other venues such as personal discipleship where God places the responsibility squarely on every person's shoulders. All should seek to grow in their own maturity and comprehension of God's word so they're able to teach God's word to others. Now, for those who particularly have this gift, don't sit around and let it go to seed. Stir that gift up. Knock the rust off of it. Sharpen it. Put it to use. God didn't take Paul and Barnabas to do something that they weren't already doing right at home at Antioch. In that, res in that respect, I'd say that, that they were just as fulfilled and intensive in their ministry at Antioch as they were abroad. We always, always desperately need more teachers. And so step up to the plate and get after it. And for all of us, Let's safeguard our hearts against wrongly responding when teaching from God's word comes to us, folks. It may chafe us at times because we are wicked sinners, but we desperately need to humble ourselves before the word of God and before the teachers that God places before us. It is for our own benefit and many, many others. There is a terrible warning that's given in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, which says that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. 
that's talking about people within local churches that can be guilty of doing that. Don't let that be you. Let's all submit to the word of God and let's submit to those gifted teachers that God has placed amongst us for our protection and for our growth and maturity. All right, I'm finished. Let's split up for a few minutes. I apologize for the, the length of my discussion today, um, but hope that it's been helpful in this gift.